I think you have to assume, I mean, everybody in this, in this world of ours is damaged. We're all damaged. Huh? It's a happy thought. It's a happy thought. Since we're all damaged, we might as well enjoy it <laughs> and be happily damaged forever. So you have to assume that, you, that the girl you're talking to is damaged. Only she doesn't know that that makes her typical. She, f she thinks it makes her weird. And that's why she can't function. In whatever way, she can't express herself, she can't get her act together, she can't get anything done, because she thinks she's uniquely damaged. You have to find a way to get into a conversation about the fact that everybody's damaged. In fact, you're not even supposed to be undamaged. If you're undamaged, something's wrong with you. Like you're not, well, you never stepped out of your house, you never tried anything and therefore never failed. I mean, what? You gotta be damaged. <clears throat> like, basically what Chassidus revolutionized Jewish thinking. Nobody's a tzaddik, will you give it up? You're just barely a bait. No, you're not even a bait. Any. <laughs> and it's fine. That's the Avoida. That's the way we're supposed to be. We didn't do this. We didn't start the fire. We didn't make the problem. And this is the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to be damaged. You're supposed to be ruined. You're supposed to be broken. And you're supposed to do something good. Personally, I mean, my girl that I work with, we talk about everything and anything, but nothing that matters. We we'll talk about her financial investments when she's going to be 30, but she can't <laughs> talk about anything that really matters, like the fact that, that matters. School. Well, yeah, it matters. She want to donate to a Chabad house? How MRI works, but like, <laughs> you talk about everything that doesn't matter, but <clears throat> she's dealing with some really, or not dealing with some really big things, and how do you help her actually? So what have you tried? Well, nothing. I tell her how MRI works and about financial investments. Yeah. <laughs> so if you try to get onto a serious subject, she just closes up? Oh, she could talk about serious things, like suicide, but not. <laughs> and nothing that matters to her will she talk about. So if you try to talk about things that matter to her, she becomes suicidal? No. <laughs> So you have to bring up the subject not in reference to her. You can't force her to talk about her, but you can talk about the issues that you think she is suffering from. I don't really know. Well, it's either anger. <laughs> it, you know, for, for over 100 years, people have been going to psychiatrists and paying a lot of money. And what have they discovered in 100 years? In a hundred years, they've discovered either you're angry and you don't know it, or you're, or you're frightened and you don't know it, or you're sad and you don't know it. That's about it. So why don't you assume you're all three? <laughs> Pay for one session and go home. You have to talk about the nature of our generation where everybody is damaged. People don't have parents. Yeah, I mean, in any real way. And um, everybody's got things to be ashamed of. And if, I, if you heard this thing, I went to a Talmud Torah class once to speak, and uh, kids in Talmud Torahs are not supposed to be there. And they know it. <laughs> so they never behave, they never learn anything. It's, it's a horror. And that's why the teacher is always looking for people to invite to speak. Because <laughs> okay. it gives them a break from the misery. So I go in there and I try to, t you can't talk to these kids. So I ask them, if I, if I told you that I had a camera that's been following you around secretly, and I have on tape everything you did in the last month, you mind if I show it to the class? 
And they said, yes. <laughs> and if I had a tape recorder, and I've been following you around, and I have every conversation you've had in the last two weeks, mind if I play it to the class? They said, yes. I said, imagine if I had a machine that has been following you around that has picked up your thoughts just for the last two hours. You mind if I play it for the class? They said, oh, yes. <laughs> I said, I don't understand how you live. How do you wake up in the morning? You're ashamed of what you do, you're ashamed of what you say, and you're ashamed of what you think. You must be miserable. They said, no, no problem. <laughs> no, no problem. You're ashamed of your actions, you're ashamed of your, of your words, and you're ashamed of your thoughts. No problem. It's true of everybody. Some people don't think so. They think only they have the problem. So they get um, introspective, introverted. They can't talk about it. Nobody should know that they're different and weird. <laughs> Somehow you have to let them know you're not so different, you're not so weird. In fact, you're ashamed to let me show the tape of what you thought the other day. I'll tell you what you thought. And what could you have thought? I, I know what you thought. What were you thinking about? Something no, nobody ever thought of before? Come on. <laughs> so the idea that a person can be weird is weird. Like sometimes a person says, I, I, uh, I have a problem, but, but I, I, I can't talk to you about it because nobody understands my problem. Really? What are you, an alien? <laughs> you have a problem from Mars? You could feel like that, though. I know. And that's so unnecessary. They're suffering for no reason. It's almost like somebody taught them what's wrong, but never told them that it's pretty common. So when they do what they were told was wrong, they think they're weird. So what happens? Let's follow an eight-year-old kid who does something wrong. He knows it's wrong. And he comes home, and instead of saying hi to his mother, he walks right past her and goes to his room because He's afraid his mother is going to know. If she looks at him, she's going to know what he did. So instead of saying hello, as he usually does, he walks right past her and runs up to his room. He does it a second time, or it happens a second time, or he does something else wrong. Now he runs past her, goes to his room, and won't come down until he has to. The third time, even when he comes down, he doesn't look at her. And if she asks him a question, he mutters. He mumbles an answer. The next time it happens, or something happens, he's staying up all night playing on, uh, on the computer. Refuses to get up in the morning. Why is he doing all that? Because he did something wrong and he's feeling guilty. Now he doesn't even remember how it started. So he's talking to his friend and his friend says, I'm going to the country with my parents next week. He says, really? My parents don't talk to me. The parents are sitting and discussing the, the kid and the mother and father are saying, you, you notice anything wrong with him? He never talks to me. I try to talk to him. He doesn't answer. This whole family is going into crisis. They're all going to be in therapy. <laughs> For years. <laughs> and then you ask this kid, does it bother you that you're ashamed of what you did? No. No. <laughs> Just destroying your life, that's all. So really what we need to talk about to all 
anybody over nine years old is tshuva. <laughs> How do you clear your conscience? Because you know you're guilty. I'm not even going to ask. I'm telling you. You are guilty as charged. Now, what are you going to do about it? A psychiatrist used to work for weeks and months and years until finally, aha, you hate your mother. <laughs> that took you that long to figure out. You could have said that the first time. <clears throat> Some guy comes into a psychiatrist. I mean, it, it shouldn't take more than 10 minutes. What's your problem? Oh, I'm depressed, I can't, okay, look, do you hate your mother or does she hate you? Come on, let's, let's get down to the business. Because it's one of the two. You hate her or she hates you, what is it? Oh no, oh no. <laughs> what, are you weird? <laughs> you don't hate your mother and she doesn't hate you? Not possible. So let's get, get to work. What do we do about that? And you can go home. What could happen in a nine-year-old's life that would ruin their life? What could happen? Hmm? He cheated on his income tax. Cheated on his tax. Okay. So what can he be guilty of? Hating his mother. <laughs> which he's afraid to tell you because that would, then you would know that he's weird. What would, what would lead up to it? His mother? He just one day wake up and decide that he hates his mother. I mean, I hope not. I, I knew a woman at Beis Chana who for 18 years, 18 years she suffered went to therapists and counselors and what did they finally figure out? When she was six years old, her mother forced her to do something that she didn't want to do. I mean, nothing horrible, she just didn't want to do it. Her mother forced her to do it and it occurred to her, like for a second, the thought went through her mind, I'm going to kill her. For a second. That's it. She had nightmares. She was freaked out. She was frightened at her own anger. 18 years she suffered for that. So I think in all cases, if you're talking to children with problems, or even children who don't yet have problems, you have to start with the assumption, we're all very messed up. And we have to be able to lighten up about it. Help them deal with it. What did you figure out that, that the girl is frightened or she is angry or she is sad? What are you supposed to do about it? So the first thing is you have to let her know that you know, which is a big relief. Then you have to let her know that now that you know it, nothing changed. You still like her, she's still fine, you're still gonna be friends. Life is not over, which diminishes the problem. Then the third thing is, what's the right thing to do when that happens? You may not even have to go to the third step. The first two could solve the whole problem. So you can say to the child, for example, um, and I would try, if you're talking to a, to a group of kids, you can say, okay, um, raise your hand if you were molested. <laughs> of course, no, of course, <laughs> right. Of course, nobody's going to raise their hand. And you say, oh, come on, don't tell me you weren't molested. Everybody's molested. See, that, that opens the door. Because what you're saying is, first of all, I know. I know you were molested. Second of all, 
doesn't scare me. Let's just talk about it. Raise your hand. That is so healing. Even if the girl doesn't raise her hand, she goes home thinking, it's not so bad. She may never even have to talk to you about it. You've already fixed the problem. Make sense? Or you can go around the problem. Does anybody know anyone who's been molested? What can we do to help them? What, what do we tell a friend who's been molested? That is so helpful. That's so what? That's so helpful. It, it allows them to be sane. And by the way, they've all been molested. They th they are they're living day by day with the, with the dreadful nightmare, with this monster in their closet. Somebody's going to find out. What? Everybody knows. Can't that be more damaging if nothing happened? And you're like, it's not a group of kids, it's one kid. And if you start saying, I know that you're really angry and whatever, and she's like, no, I'm not angry. What are you figuring me out? And you can't be more damaging they just may resist you're trying to get them to talk about it and they won't no what if you're really but, wrong so see if you come to me and say I know you're a kidnapper <laughs> you're not harming me <laughs> it's ridiculous look let, let's talk about it from from the real tell you the perspective what should a person do if they sin? This is, this is not like a rare occurrence. <laughs> what does a person do when they know that they sin? I think there, there's two things. If there's the one thing that if someone sins, someone does something wrong, and there's something that someone was wrong. It's not necessarily, you know, I think it's not like if someone was molested, it's not, you wouldn't deal with it the same way as if somebody cheated on a test. If someone's cheated on a test, they both feel guilty, but the child who was molested also feels damaged. If you cheated on a test and didn't get caught, you're not damaged. <laughs> if you get caught, you're damaged. But if you don't get, if you don't get caught, well, uh, okay, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that, but I'm not damaged. Kid who was molested feels damaged. <clears throat> so there are certain avages, certain sins that are that are personal, so it reflects on you more. A kid finds out that he was wearing shotness, I, I don't think he's going to get depressed. <laughs> go, go into a major depression and need therapy, I, I don't think so. <laughs> but um, if he feels damaged, then he can't function like a normal human being. So here's here's the first principle. Damaged is not our problem. Yiddishkeit is not about not being damaged. You're damaged, you're damaged. So what? Who says you have to be perfect? You're not allowed to do an Aveda because you're not allowed to do the Aveda. It's like that, that old story about a guy who says to a, to, to a Rov, he says, my son is Meshuggah. I don't know what to do with him. I'm Meshuggah now. He dances with women. He eats chazer. What am I going to do with him? So the Rav said, excuse me, dancing with women and eating chazer is not Meshuggah. If you dance with a chazer <laughs> and eat women, then you're Meshuggah. But dancing with women and eating chazer, you're not allowed. <laughs> There's a difference. Are you bothered by the fact that you're not allowed? Or are you bothered by the fact that you're weird? That if you did that, you must be weird. So if a person says, you know, I did something, I, I think I'm weird. Your answer should be, you think you're weird? <laughs> you're weirder than you think. <laughs> and that's not a sin. 
Being weird is not a sin. Yiddishkeit doesn't, doesn't condemn you for being weird. It assumes you're weird. <laughs> If they're bothered that you're not allowed? Same, you said, uh, so what, what the other thing? Right. The other thing is, I did something I wasn't supposed to do, and I feel, I feel regret. Really? Then, then you're a tzaddik. <laughs> that's exact, that's perfect. You did an Aveda, and you regret it. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Uh, so they don't really know what it means not allowed. This is, this is a we all have this problem. When, you, when you're told this is not allowed, it's an Aveda, this is Usr. You just did something that was Usr. What does that mean? It's an Aveda, it's not allowed, it's an Isr. What does that mean? So we, we if we're not if we're not given an explanation, we make up our own. Our own explanation usually is, you're perverted. You did that, it's an Aveda, so you must be perverted. You're, you're not cut out to be from. You're, 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 you're a goy. The real meaning of it is, not allowed means the Abish that doesn't like it. That's what it means. So we have to stop using the Hebrew words. They confuse everybody. Don't say, this is not allowed. Say, this the Eibishter doesn't like. Now let's say you did something that the Eibishter doesn't like, and you regret it. What are you regretting? Huh? Right. You're, 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 you're disappointed. You regret that that you went against the Abishta. If that's true, you're a very good person. Problem is that we're not all so sensitive about the Abishta. We're more concerned about ourselves. So if somebody says, don't do that, the Abishta doesn't like it. All right, maybe, I don't know. Don't do that. What are you, weird? You're some kind of a pervert? Whoa. That's serious. See, and it's backwards. It should be the other way. If the Abishta doesn't want it and doesn't like it, that's serious. It, it means you're weird? <laughs> I know you're weird. And if you think if you didn't do that, you wouldn't be weird. You're weird anyway. <laughs> you were weird before you did that. What, where's, the, where's the sin of being weird? Wait, you're not allowed to be weird. So we've got, see, is it a health problem or a moral problem? An Aveda is a moral problem, not a health problem. And if the... The difference between dancing with a chazer. Okay, fine. Not so much morally or healthy. Right. So you'll be saying because they're unhealthy, they can't help themselves. And then there's moral, right? It's two different... Right. Mm -hmm. So moral means... Concerned with the Abishta's opinion. That's moral. So if you tell people right and wrong basically means does the Abishta like it, does the Abishta not like it? That's and if we're good, it means we care what he likes or doesn't like. If you don't care what he likes or doesn't like, then you don't feel guilty. So what are you quetching about? Oh, because I think I'm weird. Okay, so be weird. You want to dance with a chazer? Go ahead. They'll think you're weird. Fine, so you're weird. You don't even have to stop. <laughs> you want to dance with a chazer? Go ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> Look, think about it in terms of parents. When parents hear that a kid 
left the table without benching. Are they very upset at the kid? Or they hear that the kid is um, reading or looking at uh, pornography. Which one is going to upset the parents more? The second. Which one is a bigger Aveda? First. <laughs> Not benching after eating. Hmm? Benching at the right side? Yeah. So the first is worse. Much worse. Morally, you said. Morally, right. But why are the parents more upset about the second one? Oh my God, my kid's a pervert? <laughs> <laughs> They're not worried about the Aveda. They're worried about... It's what it's going to lead to. No, the kid is doing that because that's the number one either. <laughs> no, he was looking at it while he was benching. <laughs> but you see what I mean? Parents are more concerned with their child's mental health than with their morality. And that's why parents who find out that their kid is a little weird, you know, they go and look it up and say, oh, it's not weird. Oh, okay. <laughs> But it's an Aveda. Yeah, but it's, it's natural. It's natural. People, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> My kid's normal. He's normal. He's normal. Yeah, but he's a big bal Aveda. Uh, okay, so, you know. <laughs> so we have the wrong values. We want our children to be perfect. We don't care if they're good. Some kid is playing with f matches, put himself on fire and his friend and almost burnt down the house. And they, go, they take the kid to the doctor and the mother says, well, you want th is he going to have scars? <laughs> Are there going to be scars? Uh, I don't know, a kid with a scar, I don't know. <laughs> Your kid almost killed his friend. But will there be scars? <laughs> we want our kids to be perfect. Good, not good, who cares? So, if you tell the people you're working with, you tell them what a Jew is supposed to feel guilty about and what a Jew doesn't have to feel guilty about. You're teaching him Yiddishkeit. 101, basic Yiddishkeit. You want to dance with a chazer, so dance with a chazer. So what are you there for? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Everybody has problems, so she doesn't have the problems. That's, that is, like, I don't understand. Like, it can be, like, normal when they'll have problems? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can't. But she doesn't need to tell you about problems. What are you helping her with? What, what are the parents, why do the parents ask you to help? What do they, what do they think? So how did this whole shidduch happen? <laughs> the kids sign up for the program themselves. I speak for kids in Really? I speak for kids and I speak for volunteers and we try to match up the right volunteers the right kids. So what? The kids are willing. I'm just doing it as you want to Right. Not being forced. So what did, what did this kid want when she signed up? Fine. She, she's a person, a good example. She doesn't have this, the best credit. She's not into anything she shouldn't be, but she just needs a little positive direction. So she's a role model, and she was willing to do it, so we set her up. Okay. So, your, <clears throat> so your job in this case is preventative. She wants a role model so that she won't get into trouble. So you have to tell her the same things so that she's armed with the right information. What is, what, what is a concern? What is not a concern? What should be important? What's not important? 
or less important. I think one of the first things we're told is that we have a Yetzirah. That's a very important piece of information. You have a Yetzirah. And your Yetzirah will tell you to do bad things. And your Yetzirah will... And it sounds like some kind of a devil that follows you around and gives you bad ideas which you don't have. <laughs> As if your Yetzirah is some kind of a stranger. A Yetzirah means I come first. That's what it means. The, 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 the opinion or the feeling that I come first. That's Yetzirah. Does everybody have a Yetzirah? Yeah. Everybody has that feeling, I come first. So somebody comes to you and says, I have a really big problem. And your first thought is, you don't have a big problem. I have a big problem. <laughs> your problems are nothing. Be happy you don't have my problems, because my problems come first. <laughs> it's, a, it's a natural human condition. And it doesn't come from outside. Something is telling you to feel that way. That's how you feel. <laughs>